morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. All right. Good morning. Um, welcome to this morning's or this Sabbath Sabbath school. And before we begin, as I'm starting here in Sabbath school, I thought we could sing the song here at this point, Habakkuk chapter 2, um, verses 1 to 3, I think. 1 to 3. And 4. Thank you. Habakkuk 2, 1 to 4. For those who know, um, please join. And those who don't know, please learn along with us. Um, I need Sasha Ellis and Aaron to lead out. Okay. <clears throat> I will stand, stand upon, upon my watch and set me up on the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, and said Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, so that he may run that readeth it. That readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak, shall speak, and not lie, and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, and not lie, and not lie. is lifted up is not a pride in him behold behold the just shall live by his faith but the just shall live by his faith but the just shall live by his faith amen praise the lord this is what the lord wants all of his people at the end of the world to be doing. Habakkuk is going to be present truth until Jesus comes. And before Jesus comes and when Jesus comes, he expects us to be standing upon our watch. And it's going to be a sad day at the Sunday law. So many people is not going to be standing on their watch. So many people's professing to be standing up on their watch, but they're on the wrong watchtower. There's two watchtowers. There's the one that leads to obedience, and there's the one that leads to disobedience. There's only two watchtowers. One that leads to obedience and one that leads to disobedience. But the one that leads to disobedience have you deceived to thinking that you're obedient. The one that leads to obedience, you're very aware that you're obedient and you're very conscious of those who are disobedient. And you do not follow. One heals the brain and one destroys the brain. One leads us to breathe right and one leads us to breathe wrong. One is just right and one is just clearly wrong. These are the two watchtowers. Everybody in this world is on a watchtower. Some are asleep. Some are awake, some are drowsy, some are about to go to sleep, some are dead. They're just dead on the watch tower. No one has checked, on, checked up on them in a few days. They've just been dead. But I thank God that Jesus has faithful souls, faithful watchmen that are on their watch tower, and they're keeping a faithful watch, and they're going to keep a faithful watch until Jesus comes. And I pray that by God's grace that we will be his faithful watchmen. It's a fearful time we're living in, and the only reason we don't see this time as fearful is because we might be on the wrong watch tower. That's why we don't see this time as fearful. We might actually be on the wrong watchtower. If we're on the right watchtower, we would really see how fearful this time really is. And, and it's, a really fear, it's a really sad time that we're living in, that people think that they can get into heaven without truth. All they have to do is believe in Christ and they can get into heaven. What a sad time we're living in. That all you have to do is believe in Jesus and you're just making it into heaven. That's partly true and partly wrong. Right? Is everyone following? It's part true and it's part wrong. And Satan has successfully placed the majority of the Christian world on the wrong watchtower, partly right and partly wrong. And, and Christ wants his people on the right one, fully right, fully right, no part, they're wholly right because they know what they're doing and they know where they're going. But these group of people is always few. They're always few in number. They're very few. But I thank God Jesus promised that he's going to make us many in number. There's a promise that Christ is about to make magnify this church. He has to. He's going to magnify it. But as quickly as he magnifies it, he's going to reduce it again. Is everyone following? He's going to reduce it again. He, he magnified it on the day of Pentecost. 
and then he reduced it again. And he's going to mad. This is just this is just how it's been ever since man fell. Christ brings in large numbers, large numbers go out, large numbers lot. But this is the last time that Jesus is going to work. And my prayer today is that we are we would leave here seeing the fearfulness of the time in which we're living in, and that we would really apply these things that the Lord's asked us to apply so that we can prepare ourselves for what's about to take place. Something very serious is about to take place and it's gonna it's gonna very it's gonna really really terrify people as it's supposed to as it's right is rightly supposed to do that. But let us open up with the word of prayer and then we're gonna go on to our notes um a little bit. Heavenly Father, Lord we want to thank you O Lord for this Sabbath. I pray and ask for the enlightenment of your Holy Spirit, O Lord. I understand that the truth is not desirable at the end of the world. Those who teach the pure truth, O Lord, those who hear it don't really like hearing it, dear Father. And I pray and ask, O Lord, that you'll give us a desire for the truth. You've given every man a measure of faith, and you've given, there's a desire in everyone, O Lord, that wants something better. But, Lord, the enemy is deceiving people, making them think that, that what we want is not what you're offering. But what, what we want is what he's offering. Lord, help us to see that what we want is what you are offering. Help us to see the beauty of truth, O Lord, and to choose it today. We need to choose the truth, O Lord. We need to receive the truth and the life and the love of it. The whole world is under deception, O Lord, in, in, in thinking that they're okay and that they're right. The Adventist church is under a great deception, O Lord, being rich and increased with good and saying in their hearts they have need of nothing. But Lord, I thank you for having mercy upon us for allowing us to see a little bit of what we need to see that we might take the right steps. And I pray that as we go through this Sabbath school, you'll help it to be sweet-spirited and full of life and that you would direct us. We ask for the enlightenment and the help of the Holy Spirit for the blessing and help of the angels of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible says, For whosoever committed sin transgressed also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. What are some ways that people transgress God's law? Lying. Lying, amen. Yes, that, that's... Number one, actually, that's number one. You can't transgress God's law without lying. It's impossible. You have to lie. What else? But I'm going to take that. Actually, you said the two main ones. Amen. Lying and stealing is the two main ways you transgress God's law. What was I heard you? Not keeping the Sabbath. Amen. That, that, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's, you don't know God if you don't do that one. You just don't know God. But lying and stealing are the two primary things that leads to transgression of God's law. Before man transgress God's law, he has to lie. He absolutely have to lie. Because Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because they've what? The only way to transgress God's law, one of is to reject knowledge. The only way to reject knowledge is to say it's a lie. It's a lie. That's the only way. What's my evidence for that? Genesis chapter 3, hath God said. Well, how did Satan get Eve to transgress? He lied. He lied. He led her to believe a lie, and that lie that she thought was good knowledge, and through that knowledge, she rejected God's knowledge that she would die, and she accepted Satan's knowledge that she will, she will disobey and live, and she ate the fruit. She, a lie led her to, to disobey God, and she rejected the knowledge that she will surely die simply because she did not know what death is. Because she didn't know what death is, she's never seen death, so therefore she didn't believe that she would die. Satan led her to believe that. Satan himself never seen what death was. He didn't know what it was until he actually transgressed God's law. Now he really knows he's going to die. And Ellen White says when he saw the flood, that's when he finally realized, yeah, I'm really about to die. I am going to die. And from that point on, he just unleashed every, with everything he got to make sure he take as many people as he can with him. Where am I going with this? The only way for man to live is to tell the truth and obey Christ and follow him. That's the only way for man to live. From the very beginning, God says, Adam, your life, the existence of your life is based upon law, is based upon commandment. From man's very existence, it was based upon commandment. God gave man a knowledge of law. The law says, and the Bible says, and the Lord God commanded a man that every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. For the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So man had a knowledge before he sinned. So therefore, before anyone sins, they need a knowledge of something. You cannot sin unless you have a knowledge of something. You need a knowledge of something in order for it to be constituted as sin. And the, and the way you go about sinning is you begin to lie. That's the only way you can sin is lie against that knowledge that God gave you. 
And brothers and sisters, many of us are lying here today. We're lying. If not all of us, we're all lying. And we need to fix that. But we first need to know what we're lying against. If we don't know what we're lying against, the Bible says at the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded every man everywhere to stop lying. Stop lying and do the truth. Seventh-day Adventists is the biggest liars on this planet, not the Catholic Church. Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists know more than the Catholics, so that makes them bigger than the Catholics. We know the Lord's will. We know the Lord's law, and we're not doing it. We're not doing it. Amen. Amen. You're not doing it. You're not doing the Lord's will. Well, what is God's will? Let us go into our notes. Um, let's take a look at our notes. We're going to walk through this a little slowly. Now, one thing I've learned, one thing I'm learning is that if you're a surface reader, you can't follow this movement. You can't follow this movement. You, you just can't follow this movement. If you love to stay on the surface, the things we teach is not going to be desirable to you. Can somebody go to Job 21.14, please? Job 21.14. Job 21.14. All who love to stay on the surface is not really a Seventh-day Adventist. A Seventh-day Adventist is one who doesn't stay on the surface. A Seventh-day Adventist is not a surface reader. They never was and they never will be. A true Seventh-day Adventist study their Bible, and they, and they make sure they understand the will of the Lord that they might do it and fulfill it. That's a true Seventh-day Adventist. Ye exercise. Amen. That's the Seventh-day Adventist. The Seventh-day Adventist of today is no Seventh-day Adventist at all. They may claim that name, but that's all they're doing. They're just claiming that name. But when we dissect what a Seventh-day Adventist is, we're going to see that there are no Seventh-day Adventists at all. And there's a reason why I'm speaking like this. It's necessary that we speak like this today. It's very necessary. And by the grace of God, as we go through this, I hope we see how necessary this, this is. Because if we don't speak like this, we're not even a Christian. We're not even a Christian if we don't speak like this. We must, be, we must call sin by its right name. If we don't call sin by its right name, we're not fulfilling the Lord's will, and we need to stop lying. We need to stop lying. Um, can I, Job 21, 14, please. Therefore, say unto God, therefore, therefore they say unto God, depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. What do they say? What are they doing according to Hosea 4, 6? They reject the knowledge. Everyone that has left this movement, that's what they're saying. Everyone that has left this movement, that's what they're saying. Depart from us. We desire not a knowledge of thy way. Tree of Life left this movement because they desire not a knowledge of God's ways. Future of America left this movement because they desire not a knowledge of God's ways. Bread of Life, Trees of Righteousness left this movement. How can I say they left this movement when they claim to be following this movement? The same way Catholics claim to be following Christ and is not following Christ. It's the same spirit. They desire not a knowledge of God's way. Is everyone following? Amen. It's the same spirit. It's just at a different level in the progress of their, of their growth. But it's the same spirit being manifested. Those who desire knowledge of God's way will stay in the path of the increase of knowledge. They will continue in God's way. God expects us to recognize these things so that we don't fall into the same ditch that they fall into. He expects us to recognize this. We have to recognize this and call sin. Tree of life needs to repent. Future of America needs to repent just as much as State Line and Save to Serve and the General Conference. They all need to repent. They all need to repent. And some of us in Living Waters need to do the same thing. Need to do the same thing. And by the grace of God, we're going to walk through this. So Jesus says, here's what the Lord says in this. Remember. If you like to stay on the surface, you're not going to appreciate the things being said this day. You're not going to appreciate it if you like to stay on the surface. Surface readers will be blown away by the strong meat of God's word. Those who like to stay on the surface, when the truth is preached, they will blow right out of the house of God. They will leave. That's where the Lord has taken us. Strong meat blows away surface readers. It blows them away. They will lie against the truth. They will begin to lie against the truth. Let us go on. Jesus says, Then said Jesus 
unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and do what? Follow me. Follow me. This word follow, I love this word. It has a many meaning, but the Lord says take this one. This, this, I want you to impress this one upon people. Follow me. Follow means, it means to, to pursue with the eyes. To keep to what? Looking Praise back. God. To keep the eyes what? Fixed. Fixed. What did Ellen White say? Their eyes was what? Fixed. Fixed. Following Jesus. Amen. To follow means keep the eyes fixed. Fixed upon Jesus, not the natural eyes. We can't literally see Jesus. Amen. It's the eyes of the understanding. Keep the understanding fixed upon Jesus. Then how do I do that? The truth. Keep the eyes fixed upon the truth and follow it. You know what else it means? Just go down with me to the next one. It means um, go down with me to the next one. I'm going to jump over this one. Say it. To imitate, I, that's not one, but yes, follow also means imitate. So when Jesus says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and imitate me. Amen. Copy me. Do exactly what you see me do. Don't do anything different. Exactly the way I do it, you do it. Amen. Don't do anything different. That's what it means to follow Jesus. Brethren, if we're following Jesus, it's easy to detect who's not following Jesus. If we're following Jesus, it's easy to detect who's not following Jesus. There's two ways. There's two. I'm going to spend a little time here for a little bit. It's GI. We're to be GI Christians. What does GI Joe mean? Government issued. We're to be government issued Christians. And I want to say there's general self-denial and there's individual self-denial. What is general self-denial? We're Seventh-day Adventists. Every single Seventh-day Adventist is to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. Every single Seventh-day Adventist is to believe that Ellen White is a messenger to the church. Every Adventist. And anyone who's an Adventist, and please, Seventh-day Adventist, listen. If you have a member in your congregation that doesn't believe Ellen White is a true messenger, you need to put him out of the congregation. You need to put him out. Put him or her out of the congregation. Amen. This is the truth. Put them out. What else is a Seventh-day Adventist? Every Seventh-day Adventist is supposed to not eat flesh foods. We're not supposed to eat pork or shrimp or chicken or beef. Unfortunately, many Adventists eat pork, shrimp, chicken, fish, and, and beef. They're not Seventh-day Adventists. They're not. If you're eating flesh food, you're not a Seventh-day Adventist because you're not denying the general self-denial that will give evidence that you're a follower of Christ. So if I'm denying myself and not eating flesh food, it gives me the discernment to see, wait a minute, that brother or sister has been an Adventist for two years and he's still eating flesh food? Then brothers and sisters, you should walk up to that individual and say, you're not a Seventh-day Adventist. Who gives you the right to say I'm not an Advent? I keep the Sabbath. You're eating flesh foods. No Adventist should be eating flesh food. You're bearing false witness to this message of Seventh-day Adventists. That's the kind of faith that we're supposed to have today in the end of the world. That kind of a faith. Do we have that kind of a holy boldness? To tell someone they're not a Seventh-day Adventist because they're eating flesh food? When the, when the spirit of prophecy plainly says not one person will receive the seal of God if they eat in flesh food and all who's half converted on the subject of meat eating will go out from among us to be in Seventh-day Adventists. So what is that telling me by reason? Those who eat flesh food, they're not Seventh-day Adventists because when the time comes, they're going to go out revealing what they were from the beginning. Is everyone following? Amen. This is the kind of faith we're supposed to have at the end of the world. This is the kind of faith that Christ is trying to resurrect in us once again. The, the, the people that speak the truth boldly. Boldly. Telling people to their faces, you are not what you claim to be. You're not what you claim to be. Brothers and sisters, it's about to heat up. I'm telling y'all, it's really about to heat up for us. The Lord is really going to start putting things in some of our mouth. And we're going to have to tell people that they are not what they are claiming to be. A Seventh-day Adventist is one who does not eat flesh food, is one who believes Jesus is in the most holy place, is one who believes that Ellen White is the messenger to this church, is one who believes the Seventh-day Sabbath, and is one who believes the seven times, the 2520. 
It's one who believes these things. Let us continue. So to follow, another one of it, it means pay close attention to. So follow means pay close attention to. So when Jesus says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and pay close attention to me. Pay close attention. Brethren, this is, look, if we're on the surface, you're not going to appreciate this. You know what Christ is really saying here? The very first time he took up the cross, pay close attention to him. Pay close attention to the very first time he took up the cross. That's what Jesus is saying here. The first time the cross was laid upon him, we need to pay close attention to him and see how he naturally carried the cross. Pay close attention to him because we're going to have to carry it too. And exactly how he carried it is exactly how we are to carry it because that's what God is looking for. And if we don't copy that pattern, we're not getting into the kingdom of God. We're not getting in there. We're not getting in there. Is everyone following? Mm -hmm. The very first time Jesus had to carry the cross, we need to pay close. And I'm like, that's why Ellen White says, study the life of Christ, especially his closing scene. In other words, pay close attention to the life of Christ, especially his closing scenes. Pay close attention to it. Why? Because God requires that which is past. And brethren, we get an opportunity to imitate the life of Christ exactly the way he lived it and get to be called the sons of God at the end of the world. We're the only ones that get to copy Christ's end because we're living in the end. And there's a great reward for those who copy that pattern perfectly. A great reward if we're sharers with him in his faith. Brethren, that's where we are. And if we want it, we're going to pay close attention to Christ. We're living in the time when the gospel closes. Christ lived in the time when it closed for the Jews naturally, and we're living in the time when it closes spiritually. And we must pay close attention to the pattern if we want to close it properly. If we want to close, this is very, if you like to stay on the surface, you're not going to appreciate this. You're not going to appreciate this. You're just not going to. But ultimately, pay close attention to Christ's entire life because his entire life was a cross. His entire life was a cross. Pay close attention to his entire life. And by beholding, we will become changed. The more we pay close attention to Jesus, the more we're going to become like Jesus. Ex literally, we're going to become like, you know why that is? Because the Holy Spirit, the job of the Holy Spirit is to make us what we desire. What we desire, the Holy Spirit shapes us into that desire. That's his office work. To give us the desires of our hearts. Go read what Ellen White says about the work of the Holy Spirit and desire of ages. But let us continue. Um, the very first, I have in it, the very first time that Jesus carried a cross. And now we're going to apply that saying a little bit more deeper. And I want us to see why Ellen White can say this about the first and the second angel's message. Going a little deeper with this understanding of why she says those who embrace the third have no understanding of the first and the second. And Satan understood this. And his evil eye was upon them to overthrow them. I can understand why Ellen White is saying this a little better. And here's why she says this. The first angel's message says, um, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of waters. What comes after that? And they're what? What does follow mean? Pay close attention to. What is the second angel's message doing? It's paying close attention to the first. Those who receive the second, they're keeping their eyes fixed upon the first. I want us to see something. What does the third angel's message say? The third angel does what? So the third angel's message keeps it, embraces the first and the second. The third angel's message keeps his eyes fixed upon the first and the second. How dare anyone say they're preaching the third and can't tell me nothing about the first and the second. Amen. When the messages themselves pay, say pay close attention to the first, the most important message in all of these three messages is the first one. Amen. The second and the third tells you to pay attention to the first one. 
The second says, pay close attention to the first. The third says, pay close attention to the first and the second. But none of them tell you, pay close attention to the third. So why is everyone paying so much attention to the third and losing sight of the first and the second? When the third tells you, pay close attention to the first. You know why that is? Because the only ones who teach the third is those that have the first and the second. The third angel's message is not a message to people that, that hasn't repented. It's a message being pe preached by people who has repented. Just go back to Millerite history. Yes, they keep it. They're already doing it. Amen. They're already doing it. Brethren, we, if we like to stay on the surface, you will not appreciate what's being taught. To follow means, one of his meanings to pay close attention to. And the third angel's message says, pay close att attention to the first and the second. Do you know why else that is? We're going to look into why else that is. Because it's under the first where you get the oil. The first angel's message is where you get the oil. This is so easy to prove. This is where you get the oil. And if we don't have the oil in our vessels with our lamps, we cannot teach the third angel's message. We cannot teach that message. God does not recognize us as his messengers. He just don't. He doesn't. And God, God is calling every man everywhere to repent and understand the first and the second. So I'm going to jump over that first angel's message. Now we're going to where we want to get to in the great controversy. This is probably Ellen White's most powerful book that she has written. Most powerful book she's written is The Great Controversy. The Desire of Ages is a beautiful book. It's very powerful because that helps you with the life of Christ. But if you really want to understand present truth, it's The Great Controversy. If you really want to know where we are, it's The Great Controversy. Yes, it's The Great Controversy. Brethren, The Great Controversy is just Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. That's all it is. It begins with the destruction of Jerusalem, and then it walks you right into the persecution of the church. Right there, right down to the second coming. Literally, that's what it is. You can prove right now to Adventists, if anyone is listening, where we are in regards to the great controversy. We are in chapter 35. That's where we are. Chapter 35 is the liberty of conscience threatened, the aims of the papacy. 1989 was the sign that the liberty of conscience was threatened. Right there. The next event, according to great controversy, is the impending conflict, the civil Sunday law. That's the very next thing. And between the impending conflict and the final warning, the scriptures is our safeguard. In that time, God is going to make the scriptures our safeguard like we've never, ever seen in a day in our life. Never, ever, no one has ever seen how the Lord is going to make us make the scriptures our safeguard. But I thank God it starts here. It starts here because God needs a people there in order to use to help people make the scriptures a safeguard. So God must train up a people on this side who's making the scriptures a safeguard. So when that side come, he can use them to be his shepherd, men after his own hearts that can make people make the scriptures a safeguard. The scriptures need to be a safeguard right now. Amen. Right now, it needs to be a safeguard. And brothers and sisters, the re Christ says, choose chapter two. By his grace, I was standing on my watch. And the Lord says, Kanad, I want you to take Great Controversy chapter 2, and I want you to walk through this one, because in this one, it gives a good explanation of what I'm doing, what I have done, and what I'm about to do. So Great Controversy chapter 2 is what we're going to walk through. We may not get through the whole thing because we can read it on our own. What we're going to do is just take out some points from it. We want to see where, where the church has been since its beginning, where the church should be today, and where the church is expected to go in the future. Brethren, the church has, should have never been without its cross. It should have never been without its cross, and the church should have never been without persecution. We don't understand how blessed America is. America is a blessing to the church. Christ really gave the church a little break. That's what America, America was only instituted to give his people a little break before the second resurrection of the papacy. The papacy is going to resurrect a second time. And there's so much that we need to learn about the papacy that we don't understand. So much we need to learn about that evil system. That system is so evil. There's so much we need to learn about, about, about that harlot, that witch, 
that, that's deceiving the whole world. That, that church is so disgusting and terrible. And heaven wants us to see how disgusting and terrible that witch is. And that witch has deceived Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan is one of the worst presidents in American history. And a lot of people won't understand that. He's one of the worst presidents America has ever seen. Ronald Reagan. One of the worst presidents. And the world loves him today. Man, heaven don't like what Ronald Reagan did. He's the worst president. He threatened our liberty of conscience. He was used by Satan to threaten our liberty of conscience. America is the way it is today because of Ronald Reagan being one of the worst presidents in American history. Why is he the worst? You're the worst the moment you connect yourself to the papacy. Heaven regards you as the worst. Not because you steal and you lie and you cheat. No, the moment you connect yourself to what heaven regards as the worst, you become the worst. Yes, you become the worst. You connect yourself with the enemy of God, the enemy of the cross of Christ. You're the worst. You're the worst. Heaven regards you as the worst. Ronald Reagan is the worst president in American history. Well, how many people see it that way? You only see it that way when you understand the scriptures. When you understand the scriptures, you'll see it that way. He deceived all of America. Oh, man, what a sad day. He deceived all of America. All of America. Ronald Reagan, that's what he did. Why? Because he was acting the part of Constantine. That's what he was doing. He was playing his role as Constantine. So Great Controversy, let us now begin our reading in Great Controversy, Chapter 2. You see, brethren... Why these things is not appreciated, there's a way the gospel is supposed to sound at the end of the world. But because of all the false gospels out there, when the true gospel is preached, it's not desired. Nobody wants to eat the true gospel. I know God has a true gospel being preached in this world today because he's never been without a true gospel preached. Never. Not, not once. Because if he ever has been, this world would have been destroyed. God always has a people on this earth seasoned with salt and doing the very thing he wants them to do at the very time in which they're doing it. Always. He's never been without a faithful soul. Never. And he never will be until the day Jesus comes. Praise God for that. But because of false ministries... The true one is not desired. Because of false teachers and false preachers, the true is not desired. So how does God fix that problem? How do you make people eat what they don't want to eat in the first place? Famine. Bring a famine. There's about to be a famine in the land. State line is going to starve. The general conference is going to starve. 3ABN is going to starve. Safe to serve is going to starve. Living waters is going to starve. But the true Elijah is not going to starve because Elijah is going to be supported first by ravens and then who else? The Gentiles. Elijah is going to survive that famine. Brethren, the famine is the way you prove the true from the false. That's how you prove the true from the false. And the Lord's about to bring a serious famine, not a famine of bread and water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. How do you hear the word of the Lord? How shall they hear except they be a what? Preacher. So preachers is about to <laughs> dwindle down. Yep. Preachers is seriously about to dwindle down. Many people who we think is good preachers, they're about to dwindle down. So that the true preachers can shine forth. So that the true ones who God has appointed to feed his flock can finally feed his flock. And by the grace of God, I pray that I'm one of the Lord's true, true ministers. Because I know the Lord's going to deal with everybody. He's going, to do, he's going to try every man's soul to see what sort it is. So let us go through the great controversy, chapter 2. We're going to read, and we're going to comment on some of the things we're reading. And if things come to your mind, feel free to share it. And I pray that it's a blessing. I pray that we leave here having an understanding of why I'm sounding like this and why I'm saying some of the things I'm saying. I know for a fact, if you think what I'm saying is a little harder, too much, it's about to get harder, and it's about to get harder. I promise you it's going to. It's going to, but by what the Lord is showing some things, some things I, I hold, I'm like, Lord, should I really say that? I don't know right now, but I'll hold on. Should I really say that? Because I know it's true. I know you can prove it. I know you can prove this. By God's grace, I know you can prove this. But the Lord says, 
read this chapter, and this chapter should explain why we're going to say things the way we're going to say things, or why we're saying things the way we're saying it. It's all in this chapter. It's all in this chapter. Understanding the early church is to understand the last church. Because Jesus declares the last church from the first church. Is everyone following? Mm -hmm. The early church, they received the former reign in persecution. So the last church must receive the latter reign how? In persecution. Former reign came because persecution. The latter reign is going to come because of persecution. That's how it's going to come. Well, how did, the, how did persecution come in the first place? The way persecution is going to come in the end is the way it came in the beginning. It's not coming any other way. It must come the way in the end the same way it came in the beginning. So if we want to understand how persecution comes in the end, we must first understand how it came in the beginning. And it came because of the church. Persecution came because of the church. So therefore, the Sunday law comes because of God's last day church. It comes because the last day church finally rose up and did its appointed work. That's why the Sunday law can now come. The Sunday law is not coming until the church rises up and do its appointed work. And the appointed work of the church is to agitate, agitate, agitate. Make the papacy as mad as you can. As Elijah made Jezebel as mad as he can. And as John made Herodias as mad as he can. And as Moses made Pharaoh as mad as he can. Make the papacy as mad as you can. Because she's making heaven as mad as it can. Is everyone following? Mm -hmm. Make the Jezebel as angry as you can because she's making God as angry as he can. And God is angry with the wicked every day. And God is going to have a people on the earth that expresses his anger. He will have a people on this earth that expresses the anger for the wicked man of sin. That's the third angel's message. But unfortunately, we have lowered that standard and we're compromising with evil and we refuse to call sin by its right name. Sin. It's sin. It's sin to eat flesh foods. It is sin to say Ellen White's not a prophet. It is sin. It is sin to call the 2520 a false light. It is sin. And it is sin not to recognize God's true ministers also. It is rebellion. It's rebellion. And brethren, there's another sin the Lord has highlighted. It's a sin to leave the church when Jesus says, let both grow together until the harvest. If there's people in the congregation you don't like, Jesus says, leave them alone. Learn to grow with people you don't like until the time comes to separate them. We're supposed to learn to grow with people we don't like. Jesus learned to grow with Lucifer until the time came to separate him. So who are we to say I'm leaving the church because there's people there I don't like? It is sin. You're rebelling against the straight testimony of Christ that says leave them alone. When you leave, you're trying to uproot the tears. That's what you're doing. You're not obeying the command of Christ. Let both grow together until the harvest. When Tree of Life left, they were rebelling against that command. Future of America, all of them was rebelling against such a plain testimony. You are to grow with someone that you do not like. And Jesus gave the easiest example. He allowed the disciples to grow with Judas until the harvest. The easiest example. But people want to get up and they just want to leave because I don't like that minister and I don't like what he says. Well, labor with him. Labor. Do exactly. Learn to wash the feet of the one you don't like. Try to find a way to wash his feet. Isn't that what Jesus did? Then he tried, then he washed his betrayer's feet. He tried to find a way to win him to his side. He didn't leave Judas to Satan. Judas drew himself to Satan. So everyone who left this movement, they're rebelling against Christ. Everybody. And they all need to repent. And if that spirit is in us, at this next event, we're going to do the same thing. 
we're going to do the same thing. We're going to leave Christ while claiming to be following Christ. That's the papacy. The one who left Christ and claimed to be following Christ. And if we don't have discernment, we won't be able to discern between these two spirits. There's only two spirits in this world. The spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Error is manifested in many ways, but truth can only be manifested in one way. But it's still, but truth is truth and error is error. Christ is trying to bring us to a place where we only see two classes of people, truth and error. When we get to that place, brethren, it'll be hard to deceive us. If we come to a place where we only see one side and the other side, it will be very hard to deceive us. Very hard. That's where Christ's trying to get, get us. How much time do I have left for Sabbath school, Sasha? Yeah. I'm gonna... 27 minutes. Okay, can you read that first paragraph for me, please? Because it's too long for me. And let's pay attention to the bowls. When Jesus revealed to his disciples the fate of Jerusalem and the scenes of the second advent, he foretold all the experience of his he foretold also the experience of his people from the time when he should be taken from them to his return in power and glory for their deliverance. From all of it, the Savior beheld, beheld the storms about to fall upon the apost apostolic church and, and penetrating deeper into the future. His eye discerned the fierce wasting, temp wasting tempests that were to be upon his followers in the coming ages of darkness and persecution. In a few brief utterances of awful significance, he foretold the portion which the rulers of this world would meet, would meet out to the church of God. The followers of Christ must tread the same path of humiliation, of reproach, and suffering which their master trod. The enmity that burst forth against the world's redeemer would be manifested against all who would believe on his name. Okay, can you, um, all who believe on his name. Then we'll jump down to Revelation. That's in there, right? Revelation 12, 13. Revelation 12, 13. Now, Christ is just covering the persecution of the church. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, that's all it's about. From the moment Christ left, the church should have been in a state of persecution. From the moment he left, it should have been in a state of persecution all the way down to 1798. Why is that? Because they were under the curse of the seven times. Because they were under the curse of the seven times, the church was to suffer the curse of the seven times. And they were to suffer it until 1798 and 1844. So Jesus couldn't predict any time of peace for the church. No, it was going to suffer seven until seven times is fulfilled. And then the Lord was going to raise up the United States of America and give the church a second probation. Give the church another opportunity to see if she's going to be faithful by not putting an image in the land, by reverencing the sanctuary, and honoring the Sabbath. But well, what is the church going to do at the end of the world? Break all three of those things. So what is God going to do? Seven times. But is the seven times going to be based upon time? No, because that didn't work the first time. You see, when God punishes you the second time, he doesn't do the same thing he did the first time. Because it didn't work the first time. So he needs to do it. So the second time is what? Worse than the first. So the seven times at the end of the world is the lake of fire. It's the seven last plagues, which is a type of the lake of fire. It's the Sunday law. But I want us to highlight this in the Bible. Revelation 12 says, um, 12, 13, it says, And when the dragon saw that he was cast out, cast out onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And Acts 8 says, And Saul was consenting unto, unto his death. Unto his death. And, and at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was, against, was, which was at Jerusalem. Thank you. That's all I want. Revelation 12, 13 and Acts 8, they're, they're, they're right here. This is where they are. There was a great persecution. This is what Jesus was warning the early church about. There's going to be a great persecution. And what was the reason for the great persecution? Matthew 16 tells you. It says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it because he's the son of God. Because they confess he's the son of God, there's a great persecution as upon the church. And Satan saw that he was cast up. We need to understand this. 
Satan saw that heaven cast him on. There's some beautiful truths to connect to Sean. When, when the angels, the, the sons of God, Job chapter 2 showed the sons of God, the meeting, and Satan came also as the representative of this planet. But once Jesus died, Jesus became the representative of, of this planet. People don't understand that what Jesus did, Jesus really defeated Satan morally. The only way to hold this planet is by morals. And Jesus defeated Satan by being morally correct his entire life. And because he was morally correct, God the Father, the judge of morals, the judge, God judged Christ right and judged Satan wrong. And all of the sons of God judged Satan wrong and they judged Christ right and they cast him out of heaven as fast as like lightning. They just threw Satan out. They, he found no place in heaven and Christ was installed as the representative of this planet. That's what took place in heaven. And when Satan saw that this was done, he persecuted the church that brought forth the man child. That's what he did. He persecuted, and Jesus, foreseeing this, he warned the church in advance of this. He says, Look, because Satan's gonna be cast out, I'm gonna send you forth among wolves. I'm gonna send you out there to preach the gospel. And when you go to preach the gospel, just know that the ire of the dragon is going to be against you. It's going to oppose you. But do this. Do this un even unto the end and you shall be saved. When was that supposed to stop? Never. It was never. Then why did it stop? The church fell asleep. That's what we're about to read. Oh, the church did more than fall asleep. The church did more than fall asleep. The church actually, they compromised to make it stop. They, they did a horrible thing, the church. And the same way Satan caused the early church to, to stop doing is the same way he's causing seven. The same sins that's in the Adventist church is the same sins that was in the early church. And the reason why the Lord wants us to understand these things is so that we can start discerning this spirit. If we don't start discerning this spirit, we cannot be a part of his final movement. Because in the final movement, Jesus brings the final light that this movement is supposed to receive. The same, the same spirit that, that rebelled against the light in the early church, in the Protestant church, in the Adventist church, they're going to do the same thing when this final light comes. And his shepherds must discern it immediately and check it right away. We cannot because sin cannot um, rise up a second time. When Christ gives this latter rain, the shepherds cannot allow sinners to dwell in the camp at all. At all. Cannot. The shepherds that Christ has appointed as shepherd, they're going to deal with sin. They're going to be finished throwing the javelin nonstop. They're just going to be throwing javelins, throwing javelins, throwing javelins. They're going to be checking sin at every time. Everywhere it's found, they're going to check it. Brethren, we, the day of the Lord is a serious time. And by God's grace, we're going to look into the day of the Lord is a very awful time. It's a very awful time. And, and I pray that we, that we prepare ourselves for what God's about to do. The Lord's about to work in ways that's going to scare people. And if we don't know him, we will be scared ourselves. And Ellen White says, we have nothing to fear for the future, except we forget. We, we, we don't, we're not to be afraid. The wicked is going to be afraid. We're not to be afraid of what the Lord's going to do. Can you read the next one for us, please? The history of the early church. The history of the early church testified to the fulfillment of the Savior's words. The powers of, the, of earth and hell arrayed themselves against Christ in the person of his followers. Paganism foresaw that should the gospel triumph, her temples and altars Start would... right there. What did she call paganism? Her. Remember, her. to follow Jesus. What, what we're doing right now, we're following Jesus. Pay close attention to what you're reading. Don't just read. Pay close attention. She says paganism foresaw her. What is she calling paganism now? Woman. This woman. Where, where do we find this woman? Revelation 17. This is who she saw. So this text, you have to bring in Revelation 17. She says paganism foresaw. So this woman saw, brethren, what I want us to see, what the Lord wants us to see, sin is an entity by itself. And when sin sees that righteousness is about to do away with it, sin now tells you to stop, stop that righteousness. Sin is in us, brethren. Sin is the living something. I don't know what it is, but it's a living something. And it's in all of us. And if we don't like Christ, that sin that's in you, you the moment you see the truth, you see that, man, if I accept that, I'm going to have to give up my temple and my altar of my flesh foods. 
I'm going to have to give up my temple and altar of dress in a particular way. So guess what sin does? You either become Catholic or you become atheist. You become Catholic and pretending to follow Christ and lie. Or you become atheist, just an open opposer of righteousness. Is everyone following? That's how sin leads you. It's one woman, but she has many daughters. It's one woman with many daughters. Many daughters. Revelation 17 says she's the mother of harlots. And we liken that to the papacy and who's the harlots? The Protestant churches. Naturally, that's right. Apostate. Apostate. Naturally, that's right. That's right naturally. But when it says she's the mother of harlots, it's also saying spiritually. She's the mother of Islam too. She's the mother of Islam too. She's the mother of Hindu. She's the mother of Shinto. She's the mother of Buddha. She's the mother of this. Is everyone following? She's the mother of harlots. She's the mother of them all. But where is this mother found? Where is the chief spirit found? In the Roman Catholic Church. That's where it's found. The mother, her full weight, her full everything is in the Roman Catholic Church. But she has many influential daughters all over this world. Bringing the whole world back to Mama Rome. Bringing the whole world back to Mama Rome. God wants us to understand this. And brethren, if we're not careful, that harlot is in our own hearts. It's in our own hearts. And when the truth is preached, we we're tempted to rise up against it. Because we foresee that my temple and altar has got to go away. My, I got to remove my temple and altar. So I see that if I accept this... That's why Mark left. That's why Jeff left. Because Jeff and Mark both foresaw something. And they got to get rid of their temple and altars. That's why my brother left. That's why safe to serve don't accept these things. Because they're foreseeing something. I got to put away my temple and altar. And we should also be seeing something. We are supposed to see what temple and altar we're to put away. We are so that's exactly what righteousness is designed to do, to show you what you need to put away. And there's your choice. There's where the power of the gospel comes in. Now God gives you power to put that away. He gives you power to put away what he deems to be wrong. Or you can put him away and rise up against him. Is everyone following? Matthew 16, when Jesus preached, Peter foresaw. He immediately, he saw the cross. And Peter decided he wanted to put Christ away. So what, why am I bringing that in? Brethren, no one's exempt from that evil spirit. Nobody's exempt from it. If love for sin is in our heart, we're going to want to put Christ away. We're going to want to put him away. There's a light that's coming, and, God, and we're going to foresee something in that light that we need to put away. And it's either we put it away or we put Christ away. And we're going to put Christ away by putting his people away. That's how we're going to put Christ away. Because we can't literally put Christ away today. We can only put his people away. We can only put his people away. Brethren, people are really going to go to the law. People are really going to go to the law because that's the spirit of compromise. The final compromising is when you go to the law. That's it, when you go to the law. Now your cup is really being filled. Your cup is really being filled. It's, it's really about to get that serious very soon. It's really about to get that intense very soon. Can you continue reading, please? Paganism foresaw that should the gospel triumph, her temples and altars would be swept away. Therefore, she summoned her forces to destroy Christianity. What did she do? She summoned, she summoned her forces, forces to do what? To destroy Christianity. All right, continue. So this is the early church. So at the end of the world, when they're going to foresee something, what are they going to do? Summon their forces to destroy what? Seventh-day Adventism. <laughs> Brethren, the Sunday, law, the Sunday law is the summoning of the forces. The Sunday law comes because the world is going to summon its forces to destroy a group of people on this planet. <clears throat> and whatever spirit they had in the beginning is the same spirit we need to have in the end in order for paganism, apostate Protestantism. Catholicism to summon their forces. It's going to take all three of these powers to stop God's last, to try and destroy God's last day church. They're not going to stop it, but they're going to try. 
That means God's last day people is going to be so absolutely powerful that paganism, Catholicism, and apostate Protestantism is going to have to combine their forces to try and destroy this final movement. And brethren, we should be tasting this, this, this spirit of this final movement now. We should be tasting it. We should be tasting. Continue, Father Sasha. The fires of persecution were kindled. Christ Christians were stripped of their possessions and driven from their homes. They endured a great fight of afflictions. They had trial, they had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, moreover, of bonds and imprisonments. Great numbers sealed their testimony with, the, with their blood. Noble and slave, rich and poor, learned the ignorant, were alike, learned and, in, and ignorant, were alike slain without mercy. These persecutions, beginning under Nero, about the time of the martyr, martyrdom of Paul, continued with greater or less fury of, for centuries. Christians were falsely accused of the most dreadful crimes and declared to be the cause of great calamities, famines, pestilence, and earthquake. As they became the objects of, of popular hatred and suspicion, informers stood ready for the sake of gain to, bet to betray the innocent. They were condemned as rebels against the empire, as foes of religion and pests to society. Great numbers were thrown to wild beasts or burned or lived in the amphitheaters. Some were crucified, others were covered with the skins of animals and thrust into the arena to be torn by dogs. Their punishment was often made the chief of entertainment at public fates. Fets, sorry. Vast multitudes assembled to enjoy the sight and, gre and greeted their dying agonies with laughter and applause. Wherever they sought refuge, the followers of Christ were hunted like beasts of prey. They were forced to seek concealment in, desol in desolate and solitary places, destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. The catacombs afforded shelter for thousands. All right, you can stop. Now, this is only a view of what's coming. What happened to them here is what's coming for us in the future. Now, the Lord is only trying to show us this in the past. He's veiling this for us. Right now, Christ is veiling this. And he veils it by giving us the understanding that, look, God requires that which is fast. You see what you're reading? You're really reading about your time in the future. In mercy to us, God is veiling, veiling this for us. But to open up the scenes of the future for us is when God actually shows us, now, look, they're going to inject you with Botox just to see what Botox does to your genitals when they do this. This is what they're going to do to you. Is everyone following? They're going to inject you with herpes just to see what herpes does to the brain when this is done. They're going to put this into your mouth. They're going to put a dog feces in your mouth just to see the reaction you give when feces and heroin is put into your mouth. These are the type of views that's just waiting us in the future. But in mercy to us, the Lord is veiling us, allowing us to look to the past to have an idea of what his church saw. Brethren, God would be unfair to have Christians suffer like that in the past and the people at the end of the world just walk right into heaven. That would be unfair. The people at the end of the world is going to suffer far more than what they suffered in the beginning. You know why that is? Because we've compromised far too long with the abundance of light that the Lord gave us. We, did. we need a spirit, that, a spirit that endures suffering and persecution and privation. We need the spirit of the early church. And the Lord is trying to revive and give us this spirit here at the end of the world. Go down with me. You could read the rest on your own in the middle. Jump down with me to seven, um, page seven. You can read the rest on your own. It's really some wonderful rays of truth and principles the Lord wants us to get. But when you go to seven, it says, like God's servant of old. If you can read that one for us, please. Like God's servants of old, many were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. These called to, to mind the words of their master, that when persecuted for Christ's sake, they were to be exceeding glad, for great would be their reward in heaven. For so the prophets had been persecuted before them. They rejoiced that they were accounted worthy to suffer for the truth, and songs of triumph ascended from the midst of crackling flames. You can stop right there and go down to the next one, in vain. In vain were Satan's efforts to destroy the church of Christ by violence. The great controversy in which the disciples of Jesus yielded up their lives did not cease when these faithful standard bearers fell at their post. By defeat they were conquered. God's workmen... By defeat they were what? Conquered. They were conquered. All right. I think I missed one in there I wanted to highlight. It says, it says by, by defeat they conquered. By the, yeah, that's, they conquered. They conquered. They conquered. Thank you. By defeat they conquered. That's very important to understand. Because by, by Christ's defeat, Christ conquered. 
And the Lord has shown us this is the purpose of the cross. The cross shows our defeat, but we're conquering. We're actually, we're, it's defeating the flesh, but conquering the spirit. That's all it's doing. The flesh is being defeated as it's supposed to. But the spirit is conquering because we're getting closer and closer to God and the reward. That he, but there's a, ver, there's, a, there's a one in there that I, I didn't read. And when you get the chance, you can read it. Um, I, I, it might be coming up, actually. Continue reading. It actually might be coming up. God's work. Yeah, amen. Because you have to overcome the thought that you're losing. Yes, amen. Yes, right? amen. And in overcoming that Be converted. thought, in overcoming that thought, you are an overcomer. And then you gain the victory. So amen. it has to come. And um, I know what Swinton is saying, because that's a battle I have. When yeah. people challenge what you believe, you feel you're like you're losing. Yes, you do. But I'm like, no, you're not losing because not, you can do nothing against the truth. Only you have to think what that way. What it shows is that to, the, to heaven is that you believe. Amen. Because that's God. what it comes down to. Is Amen. Do you believe in the Amen. face of anything? Amen. Continue reading, Sasha. God's workmen were slain, but his work went steadily forward. The gospel continued to spread and the number of its adherents to increase. It penetrated into, re in, into regions that were in inaccessible, even to the eagles of Rome. Said a Christian, expostulate, expostulating with the heathen rulers were who were urging forward the persecution, you may kill us, torture us, and condemn us. Your injustice is the proof that we are innocent. Stop right there. That's what I wanted. Your injustice, we really need to understand this. People's injustice towards us is proof of our innocence. Amen. Amen. We need to understand this. Why? Satan's, Satan's injustice at the cross was proof of God's innocence. And when the sons of God saw that God is really innocent... That's why Satan was cast out immediately. That God was innocent and Satan is guilty. And what do you do with the guilty? You bind them to the earth. So all the guilty must stay here on this planet. All who are guilty stays right here on this planet. While all who are innocent is taken up to heaven, the same place where Christ went. Heaven is for the innocent. The latter rain is for the innocent. We're not getting the latter rain until we prove our innocence. Is everyone following? Amen. The latter rain is gotten when we prove our innocence, brethren. The latter rain's coming at the Civil Sunday Law. Yep. It's coming at the CSL. So guess what we're about to pass through? An unjust period. Yep. An unjust period. We're about to be persecuted. We really are about to be persecuted. Yes, we are. That's what Christ is trying to get us ready for. We're about to be. Persecution is the sign of innocence. Yes, so Christ says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross of innocence. Prove your innocence by taking up the cross and follow me. Follow me. Don't, don't let them do what they want to do. It's proving your innocence. Their injustice is a sign of your innocence. But if we don't follow Christ closely, if we don't pay attention to him closely, we're going to prove we're guilty. How are you going to prove you're guilty? Because Peter says, I know not the man. He didn't follow Christ closely. He didn't follow him. Peter represents those who make the same mistake Peter did. That happened to Peter, so it doesn't happen to us at the end of the world. That happened to Peter, so we don't copy it. It's already on record. The Lord has already given an example. We don't need to follow, do what Peter did. The Lord is telling us the same thing he told Peter. One of you will betray me. That's what Christ is saying. And he's also saying, Peter, before the cock crow, before this persecution come, you're going to deny me three times. Brethren, Christ is saying that to us now. People in living waters and watching this, before this persecution come, before the civil Sunday law, you're going to deny me three times. Well, what does the record say? Peter says, Lord, I will follow you. I will follow you closely to the grave. No, you won't. No, you won't. You're going to deny me. What does Ellen White says Peter should have said? Save me from myself. So what is God given to us? The remedy for the future. God, the scripture says, I will deny you when that time comes. Please save me from myself. You've, ar you've already given me an example so that when that time comes, I won't deny. Lord, I don't want to deny you. There is a sin. There's a, there's a power in me. And that power in me wants to deny you. It wants to resist you. Please, God, save me from that 
evil that's burden. There's a evil in every single last one of us that hates Christ. It hates him to the core. And if we don't follow Christ closely, that evil will take us over like it took Peter over in that instance. Brethren, we will deny Christ in this next event. And we need to pray to him now and plead with him, God, please save me from myself. I don't know what cross you're going to allow to come my way, but whatever cross you allow to come my way, please give me power to deny my feelings and, and impulse and take it up and follow you. If the police shows up at my door, if the CIA, whoever it is, if a murderer comes to try to take my life, God help me to deny myself and take up the cross and follow you. Please, please give me that strength now. Amen. Not when it comes now. Peter was supposed to pray like that today. So God has given us the remedy by looking at the past. We're getting the remedy. By seeing the past, that's our remedy. Oh, man, I don't want to do what Peter did. That spirit that's in Peter is in all of us. Amen. So, Lord, get it out of me. Go ahead. Now, I'm just going to add to that. You know, it's very subtle how, you know, Peter in that sense, you know, instead he, he was poor in spirit. Instead, he had that, that attitude of pride. He wasn't saying it, but... You know, I'm reaching goods and I need of nothing. I'm good. Yes, you know, amen. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna amen. deny you, Christ. You know, amen. I'm going to. You know, I'm. I'm. I, I know who you are. But I, I've walked with you all this time. You know, and of course, he fell on his face. Michelle, you know? I want to say this by what you just said. This is the danger of Tree of Life, Future of America, Path of the Just, Thank Safe you. to Serve, Amazing Facts, the General Conference, the Three ABN. Every one of those ministries mm -hmm. is developing the Peter-like characteristics. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. All of them. There's only one ministry or, I don't want to say ministry, That's there's only God. one movement on this planet. There can only be one. How do I know? Because God has a people that he's leading out. Mm -hmm. What do I mean? Jesus, when he called the twelve, he was giving them insights on what's coming in the future. Was he doing that with everybody? No! He was only doing it with those who was following him closely. If you're not following him closely, you're not getting that revelation. You have no idea that Satan is coming against you. No idea what Satan is plotting against you. It's such a sad condition, man, that the world and the church is in, that Satan is laying his snares for everyone. Even the people who's following him faithfully, he's laying snares for them. He's laying snares for them and they don't even know it. Even the people following him devotedly, praying at his feet, he's laying snares for them. It's because he has to hold them in bondage too, because Christ is going to try to save them. It's, it's so subtle. That's why you so have to, sad. You have to always, always act like, not act, always be willing to learn and be to willing to be humble and, 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 and always in need and not always thinking you're good. Amen. A Christian is good. one who always lives like he's in need. Yeah. Because we're always in need. Another, um, Amen. Amen. That's nice. Cross. And Amen. I want us to understand that you don't have to be Peter. You could be John. Amen. And you could, John was nearest to Christ even in his death. And that's Amen. why Christ said to him, um, Behold thy mother. Amen. John was still there. Even up to that point, he was still there. So that, that's the life we, he wants us to have. That, that one, the one that stays close to him all the way Amen. to the cross. Why is that? Why is that? Because Christ stayed close to the Father all the way to the cross. I, don't, I really want us to see what God is asking for us right here. I really want us to see this. God is asking us to really copy Christ. Christ is the only person that's never made a mistake. Those who follow Christ, to be a part of the 144,000, you won't make one mistake. Not one. Because you're following Christ too close to make a mistake. You following? To be a part of the 144th, you're not making not one mistake. Not one. You saw Christ. Christ is the... God has to have a duplicate of his son. He has to have a duplicate. In fact, 144,000 of them. They're following Christ too closely to make a mistake. We can have that today, not tomorrow, today. If we follow Christ closely, literally, Christ will tell you what to do every step of the way. Every step of the way. 
every step. That's how close we have to follow him. But to follow Christ that close, that means you love him that close. You love him that close. How do you love Christ? You love the truth. You love to learn. You love to study your Bible. You love to pray. You love to fellowship. You love to share the truth. You love to do the things that Christ loves to do. Not, not spasmatically. Not studying to make today and not tomorrow. Not, not praying randomly. No, you, you are devoted like Christ. And you're following him closely. Brethren, God is really calling us a little high. He's calling us high and we can come up that high if we want to. If we want. How much time do I have left, Sasha? You have no time. No time? Yeah. I just want to touch this rule and I'll stop here. Rule. He says, as, as Satan kill one, another one join. Right? John 10 says, um, the thief cometh not but, to, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Exodus says, if a man shall steal an ox or a sheep or a sheep and, and kill, kill it, it, or sell it. Sell it. continue reading. Kill or, it or sell it. He shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him. For he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then, he, then shall, shall be sold for his theft. If the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. Brethren, there's a lot of light in this. A ton of light. A lot of light and a lot of principle. The papacy is going to be found stealing. The son of righteousness is going to come when the papacy is stealing. Oh, man. Oh, it's going to be a terrible time for the papacy. Terrible time for the papacy. And a terrible time for shepherds who's helping the papacy. False shepherds who's helping the papacy steal God's flock. And the way you steal God's flock, there's a text in the scripture. Just move the landmarks. Move the landmarks. And they violently take away the Lord's flock. I think it's in the book of Job, if I'm not mistaken. That's how they steal God's flock. But I want us to take this principle. For every one that Satan steals... Five must be replaced. Look at, look at this little ministry and movement. How many has Satan stolen away? So this text is telling me God's about to bring in an abundance of people. Amen. Is everyone following? Amen. God is about to bring in an abundance of people because Satan stole so many people away. He stole Stephen, so God took Paul. He took Paul. You took Stephen, I'm taking Paul. You took, you took Jerome, well, I'm taking Miller. God is going to save a lot of people. And, and Paul saved way more than Stephen. Amen. God is going to, Jesus is going to save a lot of people. Our numbers are about to grow. I know based upon this rule in the scriptures, whoever Jesus, Satan steals or kill, there must be replacements. Brethren, let's not become replacements. Let's not become replacements. Let's not be replaced unless it's like that of who? Stephen, unless we're laying down our lives for, for Christ, let us not be replaced. Don't let anybody take your crown. There is a place for somebody to take, to, to take your place if you leave. If you allow Satan to steal you away with his lies and his deception, which is what we're going to look into in the next one, with his lies and deception, Satan's greatest lie is telling people just believe in Christ. And that's it. That's it. Just believe in Christ. And unfortunately, that stealing doctrine not, didn't just creep in the Adventist church. It's set up in the Adventist church. It's set up there. Anyone who accepts that lose a desire for truth, for studying, for anything. You lose a desire altogether. And Christ is trying to resurrect the right desire again. And if we still have that desire, Satan is gradually stealing us away. And if we don't get rid of it, pretty soon we're going to be gone from God's people. We've been stolen. Everyone who's left this movement has been stolen. They've been stolen. Every one of them. They've been stolen. But they can be found again if they want to be. But if they're not found, Christ is just going to replace them with, 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 with members. That, that's going to do far more than they did when they were here among us. So by God's grace, let us not have the Lord replace us, but let us help the Lord in bringing in those replacements for that those of left, that left. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, 
Lord, the trumpet must give a certain sound, O oh Lord. And if it doesn't give that certain sound, no one will prepare themselves for the battle. And I pray, O oh Lord, that by your grace that I would have given it a certain sound. There is a way the truth is to be preached at the end of the world, that it might be attended with divine power. And if it's not attended with divine power, it will accomplish nothing. Lord, I pray that something was accomplished today. I pray that somebody's feet would go into the right direction, O oh Lord. For at the end of the world, so many feet are going into the wrong direction while thinking that they're going the right way. But Lord, please, but you have a people. You said the wise shall understand and none of the wicked shall understand. Oh Lord, help us to understand. Please give us understanding and we shall live as the psalmist says. Forgive us of our sins. I pray that Sabbath school was a blessing. And as we prepare for the next um, portion, oh Lord, please guide us through that one. Help us to cover the grounds that, that you need to be covered today and to bring in that which you desire to be brought in. For this is something that we all can read on our own. But Lord, this is one place where you're trying to show us and reveal to us that which is and that which, is, that which has been, and that which is now, and that which is to be, O oh Lord. And we really need to understand this. So please help us understand. Thank you once again for this beautiful Sabbath, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.